I'm Brock. Nice to nice to meet you. I haven't, I haven't been to one of these events before, but um, and I'm also I, I put the future self in there because well, this is about the future, and I don't think I've ever talked about the future before in my life. But I reckon I can, you know, try and make some links to some of the stuff that I do and think about it in terms of moving forward. Um, so, so the, the sort of the sort of research that I do has got to uh, focuses on on happiness, well-being, and I've got. A, I'm a social psychologist, but I also have an interest in, in mental health and well-being. And so I'm, I'm interested in how that, you know, how, how to understand mental health in context. And I think that psychologists and mental health practitioners in general haven't been all that good at doing that so far because we tend to treat individuals, um, individual minds, individual um, pharma, you know, uh, pharmacolog pharmacology to, to deal with mental illness, um, but often we can also understand it inside this bigger context of culture as well. So I, I, some of my work and, and the, the, the book that I wrote um, and a lot of the research that I do really tries to understand how how culture, and in particular cultural values, might impact on, on our own emotional functioning. And so some of the, um, you know, a good place to start is, is, I guess, with the question, is mental illness skyrocketing? Um, because I think one of the things is that if we are treating mental illness well, then it should be going down. We should be, you know, seeing it sort of start to, to, to go down. Now, there is this notion it's been skyrocketing. Um, this is some... Uh, some pretty decent data from our, our Weldon data. This is Max Rosser from uh, Oxford University. Um, he, he does some great graphs and has some pretty, he's a good data guy. I trust him. And, you know, it seems as though probably it's, it's fairly stable at the moment. The rates of mental illness worldwide are fairly stable. But if you look at earlier data before then, there is certainly has been published data showing it's been going up. Um, so whether or not you think mental illness is skyrocketing, I think the data suggests that if it has, it probably has plateaued a little bit. But what is really interesting is this difference here. Now, of course, I've just selected a few countries here. I don't, we've not got all the countries. But there are di significant differences across countries in mental illness. And so that su suggests to me, I don't, think that the, I don't think there are biological differences across the people living in these countries that would explain that. I don't think there are basic psychological differences between the people in these countries in terms of their individual psychological functioning and capacities that would explain that either. So I think that there's something there to be said about culture. Uh, it, is, it is worth noting that um, in terms of the overall disease burden, mental illness is going up. So this suggests that whilst we're getting better at treating physical illnesses, we, we're actually not getting better, or at least at the same rate, we're not, we're not able to treat mental illness. So it's, it's not, not working as well in terms of how we're, we're treating other, sort, other forms of disease and illness. So just two, I guess three, three sort of points I wanted to, to touch on um, today is, you know, is our approach to promoting mental health misguided? Um, and and can, we, can we sort of challenge the emotional value system in our culture? Can we understand mental illness inside that context in terms of how maybe the value system that's set up in our culture rather than maybe just us individually might help to explain um, not only why mental illness isn't going down, but maybe also why there are cultural differences in mental illness as well. And maybe even more, some more deeper cultural factors that, are, that we've, we've looked at as well, which might explain how people respond to their own emotional worlds. And again, these are not individual level things, but rather things that come from living and, and existing in cultures. So I guess the first thing to note is that, you know, often the way that we do approach uh, mental health is to promote this, this notion that feeling positive, feeling happy, feeling good is valuable and good. Um, and I think it's not hard to see that in the culture we live in. You can go into any bookshop and you can find a bunch of books on how to, you know, how to get happy. There's an entire, entire marketplace out there. Um, you know, I think also a really, a really important aspect of our culture and how certain emotional values are perpetrated is actually in advertising. Uh, we often forget this. Now, you don't see too many adverts out there with people looking dour and unhappy and, you know, a little bit sort of disgruntled. Um, if you want to sell a product, you want to sell it next, next to a happy face. Now, that's not, a, that's not because people are trying to perpetrate the value of happiness, but they are trying to sell their products and we do want to think that things we buy make us happy. And so we're also advertised to a lot. So there is this value, this tendency to look around, you walk through a shopping centre and you won't see too many images of people not looking happy. Sometimes it gets pretty, uh, you know, 
pretty in your face, open happiness, and uh, you know, there's, no, there's no sort of hiding there in terms of what sorts of emotion, emotional states people are pairing with their products. Um, sometimes, sometimes they get it wrong. They get, they get evil, <laughs> e evil confused with happiness. Um, but by and large, I think it's fair to say that we, we you know, in the, in the advertising space, we're surrounded by happiness. And I think this is, this, this can, it's important to take account of how this might impact on our own internal emotional worlds. We've also started measuring happiness, um, so subjective well-being and as well as objective well-being measures like GDP. We now measure subjective well-being at the country level. This is good. I think it's been good to sort of say, well, it's not just all about the economic prosperity of countries, it's also how people in those countries feel. Um, but of course, you know, now there's a certain sort of emphasis on, you know, which is the happiest country and, you know, why, why, are, the, why are the Scots not as happy as the English? Um, and, and these sort of comparison rates and you know, God forbid you have a bad day, you not only brought yourself down, you brought your country down in the rankings. There's a little bit of pressure going on. Social media, same sort of thing. We don't post images of ourselves not looking very happy and successful. We tend to post the ones of ourselves having a great time on a beach, looking fantastic, you know, some sort of, you know, some sort of overlay that look, makes it look, look particularly good. So it's fair to say that this is how we see positive emotions, this is how we see happiness and how we see the, you know, the sort of positive side of life. And on the flip side, this is how we see the negative side of our, our lives, the negative emotions. Um, we see them as problems, medical problems to be, to be dealt with, to be resolved, to be eradicated if possible. Because if, surely if we get rid of those negative emotions, we'd all be a whole lot better off. But you know, if you look at the emotion circumplex, which is, this is how we, we, we look at the entire sort of spectrum of people's emotional worlds, we can break it down into two basic dimensions. One is about arousal, um, so there are, there are high arousal and lower arousal emotions. And the other is about valence. And, and if you look at the valence dimension there, importantly, it's, it's not actually called positive and negative emotion. Although that's how we commonly refer to it, it's actually called pleasant and unpleasant emotion. And then if you look at the unpleasant emotions, and you know, over here are things like panic and anxiety and things like that, um, you know, feelings of threat. Uh, if you didn't have these, you, we probably wouldn't be here today. In fact, if we didn't have those, the capacity for those sorts of emotions, you would have walked in front of you know, a trolley or a train or a truck or gotten in by a tiger. And, and in fact, probably evolution is selected for people who do have a fair bit of negative emotion because they are the ones that actually save us. These ones over here, they kind of are good for health because they don't stress us out too much. It's good to be happy, probably, you know, a ratio of three to one maybe or something like that. You know, it's good to have these sorts of emotions. They're good for our health, but they're not actually doing much in terms of saving us. They just feel nice and relaxing. These are the ones that save us. And yet, we've somehow come up with this notion that we should all be living on this side of life. This is a successful side and this is the unsuccessful side. And I think that kind of notion is perpetrated much too easily. Uh, if we look at... Um, if we look at across nations, and this is, this is um, some, some sort of uh, 50 or I can't remember how many countries, quite a few. Um, you know, it, it is true that countries that value positive, in countries that value positive emotions, people do have a higher level of satisfaction with life. So it is nice to live in places that people like happiness. It is, it is nice to live in places that people like people to be happy, think it's valuable to be happy. But that's not what we're really talking about here. We're not saying that it's not wrong to, you know, it's a problem to actually value these things. It's, it's the fact that when you put too much pressure on one side of that emotional spectrum, you, you start to put pressure, a, a kind of contrasting or hydraulic pressure on the other side. So if you think that it's important to always be happy, that says a lot about what it means when you are sometimes sad. That's an indicator that you're failing to achieve your goals. And you, you feel a certain pressure to sort of stay on this one side of life. And so in this sense, people might feel a certain expectation not to experience depression and anxiety in their societies. And again, notice that these are questions about what other people or my society thinks I should be like, not what I think I should be like. In fact, we don't find that what people themselves think is all that predictive. We find it's much more predictive to ask people what they think others think they should feel like. So I think that society generally disapproves of people who feel depressed or anxious or would... Most people would see people who feel depressed or anxious as failing in life. Um, when others see me as depressed or anxious, they probably think I'm a failure. So when people answer or endorse these items, when, they, when they, they indicate this is what they think, then we find that in fact they start to feel bad, they, they negatively self-evaluate when they do have negative emotions, and we all have those, but it's how we respond to them which matters. And when you think that people expect you to feel a certain way, you respond badly 
to your own negative emotion, you start to judge yourself for having that, and we find that people have a greater intensity of negative emotion, a frequency of negative emotion, less satisfaction with life and more depression when they feel that expectation to, to not experience negative emotions, that pressure on them to stay on the positive side of life. We also find that to the extent that people do, um, and again this was a, a smartphone study where we followed people around and they responded to things across seven days, ten times a day, and we found that you know, at moments when people felt angry, sad, stressed, anxious and depressed, um, they were more likely to feel lonely at those moments if they endorsed that measure that I just showed you. So if we feel that society wants us to stay happy and we don't feel that way, we also feel more lonely, disconnected, isolated because of that very belief. We feel that we don't fit in because we think others expect us not to feel this way. And of course that's not a great way to respond to, to negative affect or negative emotion. Um, we also wondered, you know, uh, in, a, in a more experimental study, we wondered whether or not, you know, what, what would it be like to fail, to experience failure, which obviously is a negative emotional kind of experience, in a culture which places a lot of value on happiness. Now, quite often these days, if you walk around an organisation or even a school environment, you know, the, the, the kind of, this is, this is a bit of a mantra, you know, that happiness is good, let's promote happiness, let's keep our, our work, workplaces happy, and some overdo it more than others. Um, and so, you know, how does this culture of happiness shape the experience of failure? Of, co of course, failure is also a really important thing because if we, we don't fail, we don't innovate, we don't, we're not able to really, um, you know, it's very, very hard to achieve anything in life that if you don't fail a few times in getting there. Um, it's also really important in, in, for learning in a school environment that students feel that they can fail. But again, even in, in, in school environments, sometimes we're promoting this notion that we should sort of value happiness uh, and see it as, a, as an important end state. So we got students in, in, in this experiment to, to solve 35 anagrams in three minutes. Um, what they didn't know was approximately, approximately half of those anagrams weren't solvable. Um, and when they, when they tried their, 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 their damnness to, to solve the anagrams but, but failed, the experimenter looked a little bit surprised and disappointed. I thought you might have got at least a few more. We'll move on to the next task. Um, the no failure condition was exactly the same, except they were just simply told this is really hard, you probably won't get very many of these right. So we set up different expectations. One was they do better and they didn't. Now, they did this task in one of two rooms. One was just a normal room, just a normal sort of cubicle that you might, you might you know, that looked exactly like that, uh, except it didn't have all that stuff in it. And so in one room, we put around the sorts of things that you might find. We kind of created a kind of microculture, if you like. We had some books there, we had some, some you know, had this, this, you know, just make sure you're happy in this life, the RA with the friends looking really happy, some, some you know, stay positive and reminders of how important that is, and choose happy on the wall. So people were sitting in this room and the RA said, um, sorry, the computer isn't working in the room I've just been testing in, so we'll have to use this room. Don't mind all my things, I've just been studying in here. Have you read any of those books before? My mum got them for me to help me through my honours year and they've been a huge help. I just think it's so important to stay positive. You know, getting the overwhelm with stress or sadness is such a waste of time. These books show me how not to let the negativity get the better of me and stay happy. So they were left with that message uh, and then, then they failed miserably. Or not, or not. Or they failed miserably without that message and without those reminders. So we had three conditions, a happy room where they failed, the happy room when they didn't fail, and a neutral room where they did fail. And then we afterwards gave them a five minute breathing exercise where at 12 different points we asked them what they were thinking. And, and broadly we just were able to get from this an indication of how much they were ruminating on what had just happened, how much their mind was going back. And we know rumination is quite closely linked to depression. People who ruminate tend to not do so well. So it's not great to kind of get stuck on ruminating about you know, failure and things that have happened that have gone wrong. And we found that in the happy room people were much more likely to, to ruminate on the failure than when they weren't in that room. So again, this sort of created, this, this I guess demonstrated in some way that that, that, that cultural impact, that, that the culture we live in, creating that micro-culture and putting people in there and giving them an experience of failure, which is actually quite important in life, led them to respond worse to that experience than if they didn't have those reminders of the importance of being happy. Um, so I guess it's a little bit like this here. I'm very, very happy, but I want to be very, very, very happy, and that's why I'm miserable. <laughs> um, we also ran a, another study, I won't go into all the details here, but we, uh, again, we're interested to try and you know, show causality in some of this. So we, ran a, we had a daily diary study where we got people who were feeling depressed. Um, and, and effectively what we were able to show here is that from one day 
to the next, we could actually explain increases in depression by their responses to these social expectancies, this, this measure of sort of social expectancies. Uh, and, and it wasn't the other way around. So it's not that depressed people just feel they don't fit into the world. It's that these, this pressure is actually explaining depression. It's explaining changes on the next day, controlling for how much I was depressed today, but not the other way around. And we found we actually we, we found we could predict most of the symptoms of depression with this measure, um, and you know using network analysis could show that it actually had a high centrality. In, 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 and that what's nice about that is effectively if you've got a network of depression symptoms, what we're kind of showing is is that culture is in the middle. It's not the other way around. It's not that culture's on the inside. Culture's in the middle. Culture is the thing that is most predictive of those other sort of symptoms of depression. I won't get into all the details there, but you can, uh, you can look up the paper if you're interested. So this, I guess one of the things that we might need to do then is to challenge this emotional value system, you know, and we might need to sort of start to think about, well, why is it, you know, how could we think differently about our emotional worlds? And of course you might say, well, you know, I don't want to feel like that. That's not how I'd like to feel. That's not, that's not you know, nice to feel that way. What I'd like to feel is like this, just, you know, happy and elated and peaceful and calm and walking through fields of wheat and just generally, you know, really quite elated all the time. I mean, this is what we sort of aim for a lot in life. Um, but of course, you know, Aldous Huxley pointed out that actually this isn't really possible. Not only is it not a great value for us to live in a society that promotes this kind of value, but actually it's not really very possible. Um, and, and, you know, places or if you imagine worlds in which people do eradicate the ability to suffer, these actually seem like they, they're, quite, they're quite sort of scary places. And, and we know that, that actually the idea of endless pleasure is quite a, you know, quite a mirage. So you just can't actually have endless pleasure. If you eat chocolate, you know, here we can find that after about five pieces of chocolate it actually becomes a form of punishment. Um, there's very little pleasure in life that you can just have at a continued rate. It just isn't psychologically possible. Everything will eventually extinguish and probably become quite painful in the process. So the very idea that we can just pursue pleasure endlessly is actually itself wrought. It's not psychologically backed or, 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 poss or possible. You know, I think it's also, uh, we also forget sometimes that actually pain, our painful experiences, and I'm using pain here in a really broad sense, um, are actually the th the, the, sometimes they provide the very purpose for the things that we do. So if you take these two examples here, marathon running and, and, and education, right? Now, people, you know, people run marathons because they are, they're painful, right? If you took pain out of marathons, no one would run them. And I, I, I think that's fairly easy to show, right? If it, wasn't, if it wasn't painful, it wouldn't be challenging. If it wasn't challenging, no one would care. You wouldn't get rewarded for it. You wouldn't train for it. You wouldn't, you wouldn't get any funding for it. No one would pay to do it if you're trying to raise money. All of these things leverage off the idea that it's painful. And, and that's, what, that's what makes it difficult and challenging. That's what gives it a purpose. If you can't fail, then why bother getting a cap and a gown? If you can't fail, who's going to, well, what's the point of studying? Right? These things are there to challenge us. We need to know that we can surpass a certain bar. And that bar is set by a threshold, which is something which is not pleasurable, which is the opposite of that. So often in life, we find ourselves seeking out experiences which actually are painful because of this very reason. And some people even enjoy those sorts of experiences. We eat chilli. Um, there are a lot of things, if you think about it, we go to you know, fun parks, we watch sad movies, sad music. A lot of the things that we seek out, it's called benign masochism, uh, we, we get pleasure from. And we forget that. We forget a lot of what is in life is enjoyable, is not just pleasurable stuff. And even those experiences that we don't seek out, the things that, are, that we're exposed to, sometimes have this kind of other side to them as well. So I was in Brisbane uh, during the Brisbane floods, um, and you know, it was, it was a, a, you know, a fairly horrible time for the community. Um, but you know, the, the response was amazing. Some 55,000 people turned up to, to help, help with this clean-up effort. Um, you know, I'd, I'd been there in Brisbane, had, had, won the, um, had won the state of origin about five years running, and, you know, people, in, they were pretty proud of this, right? They'd been in Sydney, New South Wales for, for five years. But you, you didn't see the sort of community come out of that that you saw come out of this kind of, this kind of you know, um, difficult experience. And, and so people came together and there was something very positive in that. You also see that data showing, you know, in response to a September 11, that volunteering across, across the, the United States and across a whole range of activities, even unrelated activities, spiked in response to that, you know, 
obviously not very pleasant event. So even these sorts of events, which you wouldn't seek out, the things you wouldn't hope anyone would have to go, to, go through, still sometimes have a different, there's a different way of look at, looking at them. They're not just it's simply all bad. So we also examined this in a, in, in a study. We wondered whether or not we could show that, that, that experiencing pain might actually bring people together and might actually facilitate group bonding and even, even cooperation. So we, we got people into the lab and we got them to put their hands in, in buckets of ice um, for as long as they could or do leg squats. And in the control condition, they simply, they were, the water wasn't as cold and they just balanced on one leg. So they are very similar tasks, but non-painful versus tasks which made them experience some pain. And then we, uh, after they'd done this in groups of about six, we asked them you know, whether they felt a sense of solidarity or con felt connected, uh, feel a part of this group, felt a sense of loyalty, or that they can trust other people in the group. And we found that, again, that the people who'd been, well not again, but firstly, the people who'd been through these, this painful experience felt more bonded together because of it. Even just a little bit of lab-based pain, not, not, you know, not a flood or a, a terrorist attack or anything like that, but just a little bit of lab pain had led to this, this sort of psychological feeling of being bonded. We wonder whether we could get a, you know, to move this on to, to looking at behaviour. Um, and, and so we, we ran a study where we could actually test how much people were likely to cooperate. And of course, cooperation comes with a risk. You need to trust people if you're going to cooperate with them. You need to sort of think they're going to reciprocate. And so in this, in this uh, game here, you can choose a number between one and seven over six trials. If you choose a, a seven, um, you, will, you, will, uh, you will get paid $7.80 and people got paid. Um, but only if everybody else in your group chooses a seven. If, if one person in your group chooses a one and backs themselves for $4.20, meaning that no, no matter what anyone else does, they will get $4.20, everyone who chose seven and did the more cooperative thing now only gets 60 cents. So there's a, you can see the matrix, matrix is here, right? So that the higher the number, the more cooperative and trusting I am of my group members. The lower the number, the more I'm likely to say, no, I'm just gonna take what I can get and get out of here. So we found that after those two tasks, uh, the people who did the painful ones were more likely to choose the higher numbers in those groups than people who did the lower ones. We, we then thought that, you know, that, that putting hands in ice buckets and doing leg squats together in groups wasn't really what people do in life, but people do eat hot food together, they do eat chilli. So we ran a study where we got people to eat bird's eyed chilies um, in a group or they, uh, they had a, a, a butterscotch sweet. So again, a painful food versus a, a less painful food. And again, I should probably make clear that in all of these studies when we run them, people don't know what we're trying to measure. They don't, we, we always use a cover story. So the whole point is people don't, we don't tell people, hey, we're interested in whether or not this, didn't. we don't do that. So people think they're doing a, a consumer survey or something like this. Again, we found the same effect, that after, that after pain, people were more likely to cooperate. Um, we've also found in some, in some recent data that, um, you know, that, that, that meaning, meaning in life, we know we're, often, we're often interested in finding meaning. Meaning isn't, you know, and sometimes if we, we might go on a meditation retreat or we might find, seek out these sort of uh, low arousal calming exercises to find meaning in life. They're not the ones we actually re re remember as meaningful. If you ask people the things they remember as meaningful, they're the more intense, ex they're the more intense experiences in life. They're the ones that are both, you know, whether it's, whether it's maximum pain or maximum pleasure on both sides of that spectrum, these are the things which we remember as meaningful in life. So even there, you know, the negative experiences, the, the quite intense ones, are the ones that actually give our life a sense of meaning and purpose. And those calm, nice, pleasant experiences, even, even you know, the less intense ones, they, didn't, they tend to be, in the middle here, they tend to have, you know, the, we, we don't recall them as much as being significant and meaningful experiences in our lives. I think it's also fair to say that, you know, that it's, it's pretty hard to, you know, resilience is a really important psychological construct. It's, it's something that, you know, people want to develop. You know, it's, it's important to be able to be resilient in life. That means to be able to bounce off, you know, setbacks. Um, and, and maybe we sometimes get a bit confused about that in terms of, you know, how to teach or how to train people to be resilient because, um, you know, one of the things that resilient people do is they stay calm uh, when they have these setbacks. But, Teaching people to stay calm is not how you teach or how you develop resilience. You never resil you'll never get resilience in that sort of way. The way you get resilience is through exposure. In the same way that you might expect that biological immunisation will make the physical system more resilient, I think you know, psychological immunisation makes the psychological system more resilient. You need exposure to difficulty, to hardship, to pain, to some of these, these, these knockbacks in life, failures. 
These are the things which build resilience. You can't build resilience if you don't have them. And again, this, is, this has been a bit popularised at the moment with the, the idea, particularly in America, that, you know, that some, you know, that's, I guess they're called the snowflake generation. Don't know how true this is, but um, certainly the notion that people are becoming less tolerant, not only of, uh, of difficulty in life, but even of just diversity in opinion. Um, and, and again, you know, this idea that uncomfortable things, I should be protected from uncomfortable things in life, um, I don't think is doing anyone very much good. And again, according to the most basic tenets of psychology, helping people with anxiety disorders avoid the things they fear is misguided. We know that exposure therapy works. That's effectively what we're talking here about, is exposure therapy. It's exposing people to things and recognising that those, those painful and, and negative events in life are actually critical for developing these capacities. One of the other things we know is that when you frame those, those experiences in particular kinds of ways, it actually change, changes how you respond to them. So this is a study where, uh, where they told people um, that, that the pain they were going to experience could benefit them in some sort of way versus just not the normal, the normal instructions for a pain study. And they found that people at a, at a you know, the, 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 the ex people not only reported less experience of pain, but actually, you know, when they thought it was going to benefit them, the brain literally responded better to that experience. It activated opioid and the cannabinoid systems, which are good for responding to pain. And when it was framed in that positive light, it was they were, people were more, more able, even at that biological level, to respond to it better. So again, if we, if we frame our painful experiences in this negative way and see them only as bad, then, you know, as things we should be avoided, we're not really giving ourselves the best step forward in terms of dealing with them well when, when they do come. And I think, again, you know, even when we look at, um, you know, med the use of uh, medication, that it's just continuing to go up. We're, we're becoming less and less tolerant of these experiences in life and we feel that we should be able to more and more reach for something to eradicate them. So that's my, that's my spill on, I guess, the two sides of the, the cultural value system on emotion and how it might be doing our mental, mental health damage. Um, and I think that these things at the moment are probably, you know, if we're going to talk about the future, are probably, you know, still moving forward in these sorts of ways. I don't think we've yet quite adjusted that. But just... Just lastly, and, and I won't spend too much time on this, um, you know, is, is, there, is there a role for culture really in understanding all of this? Can we see all of this stuff at the level of culture? Um, you know, can, we, can we make sense of why this, there is this big gap in, in mental illness across, across cultures? You know, presumably people here are not experiencing fewer negative emotions in life, it would be unlikely. We all experience negative emotion. We all have that, that emotional circumplex. So why do some of us go on to develop mental illness in response to those negative experiences and others not? I mean, there's certainly robust debate about you know, the fact that there are these differences. So some people say these aren't real. They're just measurement error. Um, we can't, you know, that, that basically we're not measuring it correctly. Look, there's some evidence for that, but there's also a lot of people who are coming out now and saying, you know, the fact that these cultural differences exist in the prevalence of mental illness, and they're quite stark. Um, in terms of rates of depression and anxiety. Um, you know, in the West, much higher, and, and, and what we find is in, in Asia, in particular, lower. So what's the difference? Um, could it be that Easterners, and this is, the, again, the contrast that we've focused on most here, could it be that, that Easterners, um, you know, respond more adaptively to negative emotion than Westerners? Again, it's unlikely that people across these countries are experiencing different rates of negative emotion. It's more how are they responding to that negative emotion? And again, hopefully, as I've, I've made clear, some of the cultural values that are set up and, and some of those cultural values that are communicated to us, what, what the problem there is, is how they shape our response to our negative emotions, which are inevitable. Um, and so one of the things we know across these two cultures is uh, that, that people think in more of a dialectical way in Eastern cultures. Um, and, and so this is a sort of interdependent, holistic and dialectic way of seeing the world, not just emotions, but actually the, the, the world and, and our relationships to each other, versus uh, in Western cultures, a more independent, analytic and essentialist notion. So this plays out across decision, uh, you know, perception, decision making, in general, even prediction about the future. Um, there are major differences across these cultures in terms of how people think about the world they live in at very, very basic level. And so we've, we've um, proposed and we've drawn together evidence which would suggest that, um, you know, 
some of the ways of thinking in, in uh, Eastern and dialectical approaches are actually quite helpful for dealing with negative emotion. And so we, we notice here that, you know, in, in a dialectical way of thinking about the world, you, you accept contradiction. You don't try and resolve it all of the time. A Western analytic way is more likely to seek to resolve contradiction. Um, you expect change. So even when people uh, you know, ask people across culture to predict stock market trends, uh, you know, Westerners will predict that it will keep going up, whereas Easterners will predict that if it's going up, it's going to come down. So we see this very, very basic notions that the world changes versus it's, it, it's, it's more stable. Um, and also that, you know, again, in the, in that, that way of seeing the self in the very interdependent kind of way where, where you know, I am defined by my relationships with people versus I am an independent unit. Um, which I think again is defining of Western culture and that interdependent self is much more defining of Eastern culture, although I think this is changing. Um, but to the extent that people do that, I won't go into the detail, but what, we, what we've, you know, throughout the literature and psychology there's evidence that these ways of thinking are actually adaptive ways of responding to negative emotion. And it, that might help us to understand why it is that people in the East are better able to sometimes respond to their negative emotion and are less likely to go on to develop psychological disorder. At least based on the, on the epidemiological data. And I think also, anecdotally, you, you can look at, um, you know, look at the ways that we're, the, the ways that we're using psychotherapy in, in, uh, in Western culture, and a lot of it is drawing on Eastern concepts more and more. And so it does suggest there's some utility there, even at that sort of anecdotal level. Um, okay. So I guess... I guess just, just very quickly, um, you know, where, where, where does this leave us? Because this is the future part of the talk at the end. Um, you know, I, I suppose a couple of questions is, you know, what, what is the future of mental health treatment? Should we be treating individuals or should we start to, to you know, think about how we might treat individuals or, or, or treat cultures? Or, or how people maybe, you know, one, one concept I've been thinking about a bit is, you know, this notion of social inoculation. Maybe we need to think about how we can help people deal with the cultures they live in as well. Um, I don't have any real concrete thoughts there, but I think it, certainly I'm interested in starting to look at these, these sort of more cultural level uh, ways of thinking about mental health and how we can start to treat people at that level as well. Um, and I guess also, what's the future of the self? And, and I think this is, this is again just something that I've only been recently thinking about, but. You know, I think we do suffer, and particularly in the West, and I think increasingly so worldwide, of you know, what we might call individualitis. You know, this, this tendency to see ourselves as an individual, I think this also comes from, um, from, from residential mobility. We're moving around a lot more. So we, it's, not that, it's not that we can actually go backwards and start to reconstruct ourselves as sort of members of these, these tightly sort of knitted communities. I mean, we are changing, and the world is changing, but how do, we, how do we overcome some of the problems that that leaves us with? Uh, which is we do see ourselves as disconnected in a way. Um, and not only does that lead to things like loneliness and uh, social isolation, um, but maybe it also changes at a fundamental level how we, how we understand ourself, how ourself in relation to others, in relation to the world around us. Um, and maybe this has implications for you know, how we need to think about what, what kind of thinking and what kinds of ways of understanding we, we, want, to, we want to promote going forward. So that's me. Thank you very much. That's the book that, we, that was mentioned um, and um, some websites there and also, also a business that I run around ethics. So thank you. We've got some time for questions. Um, so is, has anybody got any questions they'd like to post at this time? Lynette. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Brock. I, that was really good, actually. I really enjoyed that. Um, I wonder if you could possibly begin to enlighten me on why we see happy faces as more attractive than unhappy faces or Yeah, yeah. Do we? Well, I do. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I don't know. I mean, that's, that's a loaded. That's that's a hard question to answer by, uh, you know, directly saying that we do or whether or not that's something that's that's culture. I mean, I, I think that we like people who. I mean, look, I've got a. a you know, I've thought of this myself. I've got a, I've got a eight week old baby at home, and you know, you, and you look at the, and, he, and he smiles like, oh, he smiled. Um, you know, because we do, right? It's nice, and I think that that indicates that people. You know, it's it's easy to have interactions with people when they're happy. So that's certainly true. I don't think that that's, it's universally or, or, or absolutely totally always the case though and I think if you know anybody who never displays any of the other side of their emotional world, 
you know, it's, it's sort of hard to relate to them. Yeah. And actually sometimes we like it when someone comes to us miserable, right? So we don't like people to be miserable all the time, but I think we don't like people to be happy all the time either. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, this might delve into a bit of spirituality here, but I'll, whatever, I'll just go for it. Having lived in the East, I've lived in the East for about a couple of years, parents lived there for 15 years, I, I have a feeling there might be a correlation between they were cut off from the West for so many years mm. and being cut off, they were under so much oppression. And when a country becomes oppressed, mm. they lose that sense of self. They become very mm. monotonous, mm. same, same. The West was very open, very confident, very allowed to be themselves, who they wanted to be. Could it be the idea of allowing you to be yourself holistically, spiritually, could that be a cause of depression? Because when you realize and you're conscious about your own self-worth, mm. you almost, because you're not achieving that, you become yeah. depressed. Yeah, well, I, 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 think, I think just this whole focus on the self, mm. I think that's a really big thing. And, and you know, psychologically, we, we perpetrate this, right? I, I think it's important. Yeah. If, you've got a, you know, if you've got thoughts and emotions you don't know how to handle, you need to focus on yourself and work yourself out, right? You mm. need to problem solve the self. But I don't think that, you know, that once you, once you treat that problem, I don't think that you're going to achieve everlasting well-being by focusing more and more and more on yourself. Yeah. Right? Absolutely not. In fact, I think you probably would just want to focus a whole lot less because we're pretty boring, actually. So, so do you think as we evolve, mm. especially with the evolution of artificial intelligent machines and so forth, do you think we're going to lose that individuality as we go move forward? And do you think it's better for society to have less individuality? Well, I don't know. I mean, I think it's increasing. I think it's growing. Again, mm. like, you know, residential mobility is a really big part of this. We move yeah. around all the time. So we're disconnected from even our, our genetic links sometimes, mm. right? Um, and, and then we, 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 make, we, we manage to, um, to, to make up for that in, in the way that we engage online. Um, and, and I think, what's that, ASMR, is it? Um, where people yes. Yeah. 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 <laughs> right, which is amazing. basically like having someone close to you sort of giving you a kiss in the mm. ear and sometimes actually do that, right? Uh, and this is this is people in it, this is a big industry, right? So people are going online to have people make sounds as if there's someone very close to them. Yeah. Um, because and, and, it's, and people find it resolves their anxiety, right? And, and, this, and so I think we're finding ways to substitute um, and to make up for the fact we don't have those strong ties and we have a lot of weak ties. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think we're going to go backwards though. So the question is, what are we going to do moving forwards? I don't think we're about to go back and form small hubs of humans living in little tight communities. I, I just don't see it happening. Mm. You move into any big city, it's not like it, how it is. Um, and the cities are getting bigger and the hum humans are populating more. Um, so yeah, I, I, we're going to have to think about a different way forward. I don't think you can go backwards in that one easily. Like we evolve with... Yeah, needs. and work out, work out how to, how to yeah. satisfy those needs, um, assuming that, they can re that those needs remain, but I think they probably will. But then it raised the whole question about what is it to be conscious? And then you've got to argue. <laughs> <hard work. laughs> that's what I sit down. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I've, I've got a question. Um, this is a, uh, the way that people are responding to social media, and it seems to be becoming much and much of a more prevalent aspect in people's lives. In fact, a lot of people spend a hell of a lot of time on social media um, these days, and, and they interact with, in some cases, more with their friends on social media than they do in face to face in yeah. some cases yeah. um, but there are the interests of the the, the companies that run these social mm. media outlets they're competing with other social media outlets yeah. and they've got teams of psychologists or with you know thousands of PhDs um, yes. you know go all getting funneled into developing algorithms to, um, to to aim these algorithms at you and me yeah. running on supercomputers aimed at you and me, trying to get us to come back and use their show, social media outlets. Okay, yeah, so yeah. in terms of our own mental health, um, how can we go about understanding the psychology that, you know, mm -hmm. that, that you've been describing and, 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 yeah. and what, what types of psychology um, do you think that we need to understand in order to move forward and still um, have a sense of well-being instead of being goaded and nudged around by the interests of big social media outlets? Oh look, we're always going to be goaded and nudged around by the people, that's how we are. And that's our basic nature, we're social creatures, so we, we influence each other. So we're, I, don't think, I don't think that's going away, I think it's probably, yeah, I don't think it's going away. 
So we can, we can, we can be goaded by people, absolutely. Um, and I guess that's more about issues of structural power than it is about a specific, specific psychological question. Um, but I guess, we, I guess if, if we are to, to resist some of that, then I, I suppose it's about understanding and having that insight and being aware. I think that's a big part of it. So I think that you know, often, often people just aren't aware, if, you, if I you know, talk about my own work for a minute, if people just aren't aware of the value systems that, are, that, that they're confronted by and they're not aware of how that's, in, that's impacting on them. We're not aware that, you, that, you know, that the living in society is giving us a particular view of our own emotional worlds, which is not probably evolutionarily really that feasible. Um, but that's how it is. And, and, but when, you, when, you, when people become aware of that or, or you sort of think about it and you go, oh, yeah, I can actually see that, it's, it, there's a bit of inoculation in there, right? You can actually start to shape how you respond to that. You can be aware and, and conscious of it. So I think the same with social media, rather than just clicking on the next sort of buzz button that, that gives you the, the right dopamine hit, you can sort of step back from that and make a choice. How am I going to respond? And, and look, we do this, this, this is how humans are. I mean, we're all basically racist, right? Um, we are at, at, at a very, a very low level. This is unconscious bias. It's everywhere at the moment, right? We're all basically racist. But we overcome that because we know better. Um, and, and so that, that's what we do. We, we, we have all of these sort of you know, evolved tendencies that we have to overcome. And we have to do those sort of low level, fast paced kind of reactions or, or decision making um, processes. And we have to overcome them. And so that people can feed into them and get us to addicted to things. We can also step back from that and say, hang on a sec, no, I don't think I'm going to do that. I'm going to turn it off and go to the park. So that's a choice we've got if we're aware of it. Yeah. As an individual, but what about um, you know if, if we see that societies are getting depressed? How, how do we approach the problem at a at a uh, yeah. population level? Yeah, exactly. I think I think I mean this is this is the this is the good question, and I think we need to, and I think you can. I mean, we do lots of things at the population level. I mean, we didn't sit down, we didn't we didn't sit people down and say, hey, each and every one of you stop drinking driving, right? We we put so we put campaigns out there to change behaviour, so we can we can affect society. At, we can, you know, at, at, a, at a social level. Um, there's, a, there's a Dutch campaign going around at the moment, it's simply about being nice to each other. So it's a big, you know, it's a, it's, it's a nationwide thing, just saying, hey, wouldn't it be nice to be nice to each other? It sounds a bit kind of, you know, but it probably works. Um, so these are, these are the sorts of ways, yeah, so we can influence at societal level, we just haven't really found, we haven't, we haven't started doing it very well. There are certainly mental health awareness things and, and stuff like that but I think that we could do better we could certainly be pushing some of these these sort of more mental health awareness things rather than mental illness awareness things and that, that could be a big you know, a big contributor excellent well thank you that was fantastic thanks so much for that. Yeah, well,